today presenting with me, we also have Danielle Saunders, who's our ecosystem analyst for the talent portfolio. Um, we're also bringing on two special guests today that will be speaking to their experience on working to connect data across the talent ecosystem. So we have Casey Thorne from Western Governors University and Josh Westfell from the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. So you'll get to hear a little bit more about the work of our partners and what they've been doing to connect um, this ecosystem. So just a couple, a couple words about us at Bright Hive. Some of you may be familiar with us, but others might not be. So just wanted to give a quick sense of, of what we do. Um, Bright Hive is a social benefit company that helps organizations share responsibly with other organizations in their network um, with this goal around collaborating with that shared data. And we do this primarily through our data trust. So we help organizations set up that legal, technical, and governance framework to responsibly share data in sustainable ways. Um, and for us, I think this work really comes from witnessing firsthand just how challenging it is for organizations to share data and they really need that shared data to drive decision making. Um, and we know that it's really hard to measure your own impact with only your own data. Um, so we help create that framework and that ability for that data to be shared. We've done a lot of work to date in the post-secondary and workforce space. Um, and that's what we'll be getting into today is talking about how we've helped um, the talent marketplace specifically move um, from being more siloed to more connected um, in, in data sharing. So that's what we're gonna be getting into today. We can go to the next slide. So to set a little context, it's, you know, we, I think, have been working in this, this space of workforce and post-secondary ed, hiring skills for a while. Um, but as we've seen COVID come into the forefront, it's really just upended our employment and education systems. Now seeing the numbers of 30 million plus people unemployed and rising, um, nearly 15% of our labor force. Um, and we're, you know, taking into account the fact that there's a lot of workers who have stopped looking for work um, and stopped seeking employment. So the numbers are, are saying that we might be even closer to a quarter of our, of our workforce um, wanting but lacking employment at this, at this moment in time. And these are both huge records. Um, so even in a non-COVID world, we have been doing this work in the talent marketplace where individuals, employers, and educators are coming together to essentially to make transactions. So trying to find the right talent to hire, trying to share information about training programs and education. Um, but why is it so hard for workers to share their skills and be seen by employers? Um, why is it hard for employers to be able to fill open roles and find the talent they need? And why is it so hard for, for individuals um, to navigate that training and education marketplace? It's, it feels like these disconnects existed before, but now we're definitely feeling them more than ever. Thanks, Laura. Let's talk about these disconnects. Um, so opportunity seekers, students, job seekers, are struggling to navigate education and training options. There's no easy way for them to compare program costs, understand program quality, and if it leads to a well-paying job or even lifelong well-being like what the Gallup studies um, and their surveys look at. Online, you can learn more about the longevity of something like a pair of shoes, <laughs> more about that than an education or training program. So they also struggle to showcase their skills to employers and get hired. This is often a painful process of putting yourself on paper over and over and over and hoping for the best that you said what they wanted to hear. And it can be a game of trust and data entry that doesn't favor the job seeker. And that's just on the worker and learner side. For employers, they also miss out on talent due to inefficient hiring processes. Employers have been saying that applicants lack skills or experience 
the time to hire is too long, they don't know what skills their current workforce has, and this can be the result of imprecise and heavy-handed screening and internal systems that contribute to a needless barrier to employment and advancement or reskilling. Then, on the last side of this triangle, training and education providers also struggle to communicate their economic value to potential students who overwhelmingly attend uh, higher education to improve their job prospects. These are all disconnects that we see happening today, but they're amplified by COVID and they're rooted in data. Oops, so let's, let's talk about a real world example. I'm gonna talk about someone named Olivia, who's 19 years old. She was working in a restaurant before the layoffs. She's Hispanic. Her demographics and industry have been hit hardest by the pandemic. So they had seen the largest increase, they have seen the largest increase in unemployment so far. She doesn't know what to do. Um, she's looking for work online, it's not working, but luckily she gets some help from family to go to school. So this, um, this, this journey is showing some sentiment. So her at the beginning of this process, it doesn't feel good. Important decision-making information is missing. But um, she sees a lot of options for going to school. She likes psychology. The programs are difficult to tell apart. So she picks a community college, but unknowingly passes over another one that has much better outcomes. During her second semester, a career counselor shows her her unemployment options and, or sorry, her employment options, and she becomes discouraged. She realizes that this major isn't really going to meet her long-term goals. And she feels like she might have been wasting her time. So she does pivot uh, to public health, given the recent crisis. As a result, she spends an extra two years in study, but she gets her bachelor's. She works part-time, she volunteers in the field, and practices extensively in her community. This is a great feeling. When she applies for work, the amount of experience described in her resume is not understood by the employer she's applying to. And she's passed over by many positions, um, for many positions which she was actually more qualified or skilled than the competition, leading to a much longer search than is really necessary. Um, and this can be a very depressing experience. Um, and this can be, um, you know, really something that causes you to um, wonder, what did I do wrong? When in reality, you might actually have what you need. Um, then, though, she is hired. Her resume and transcript are accepted by the employer. They're put into a folder, though, um, and her skills are not documented. The information isn't ingested by the employer in um, a way that uh, helps them understand her skills and her ability as they grow as she's working. So as a result, she's passed over for an opportunity because management doesn't realize that she has a specialty in community work that's coming into high demand. So in this journey, industry and education missed an opportunity to guide her um, throughout the process. Um, education missed out on sending her on her way with a clear and comprehensive package of skills for employers and other opportunities. And she missed a chance to impress employers early in her search and during employment. So Laura, what's going on? How do we fix this? Yes, so that was a great um, user story and always appreciate hearing those because it gives real texture and, and color to the challenges that we know fo folks are facing in this market. Um, so oftentimes we'll be in conversations and the, the question will be asked like, don't we just need a better app? Don't we just need some more tools? Can't this need be met by um, an application? And the answer is yes, I mean, having better tools and apps um, and the ability for someone like Olivia to search her training options or to get hired and express her skills absolutely will help. But the um, what those applications are running on is data and it's up to date data being provided at the right time to aid decision making. So where we work at Bright Hive is really at this data layer. Um, the application layer that sits on top of it is super important, but we come from a, a recognition that um, the apps are only as useful as 
the data that's in them. So we've been in, I think, many conversations where someone will come, come forward and say, well, we have a new app that we developed that can solve this. We just need this one magic bullet app that will solve all the problems, right? Um, and so we've been working with partners on understanding some of these disconnects within that data layer um, as part of this effort to make these tools ultimately be more valuable to the end users, which could be an employer or an individual, um, and helping the app developers understand some of these nuances of data sharing and interoperability, um, and really thinking about the data that needs to go into these tools and where it can be sourced on. So thinking about the data from training providers, thinking about data from employers on their skills and open jobs, um, and the ability for individuals themselves to have records of their skills and their um, credentials they've attained and experiences that they've gained on the job. You can go to the next slide. So we really think of these disconnects um, as part of this data infrastructure that really needs to be improved. Um, and when we talk about inter interoperability, what we really mean is the ability for uh, computer systems and software to exchange information. Um, basically, can these systems talk to each other? And what we've learned in this work is that employers and educators are using different systems. So when they can't share data with one another without a lot of manual input, it means that the ultimate user, the individual um, employer educator, they're missing out on key pieces of the data puzzle, which means they're not getting all the information they need in one place to make a decision. So a couple of these, um, these disconnects that stem from this lack of interoperability um, we see these employer and educator systems that can't talk to each other. We see folks using all kinds of data standards um, if they're using them at all. And when they are used, um, they might not be coordinated or mapped in a way that really helps that data be able to talk to each other when shared. Um, we also see resumes and job postings just post on the web and not always in a machine readable format. So it just makes it more difficult to find the information and be able to really parse out what skills are needed for those jobs. Um, and there's no common language around sharing skills data. Um, so these are some of the issues around interoperability that we've observed. And these are also the issues that we've been working closely with folks in this ecosystem, um, including the folks that we've asked to join the call today to speak up a little bit about their work. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit on the next slide where we'll share some of the steps that we've started to take in um, attempting to connect this disconnected uh, ecosystem of talent data. So what have we done to start addressing some of these challenges around interoperability and around data infrastructure? So we've been working with a range of stakeholders who kind of represent different, um, different pieces of this puzzle. So the educators, the employers, uh, groups representing individuals, and um, really thinking about how do we come together and what does it look like when we see public and private sector employers and educators uh, approaching these common challenges with connected data. So working with groups that are creating new data standards or new new languages for describing credentials with workforce groups that are really interested in connecting training program data with wage data so that they can calculate and understand program outcomes. Um, groups like the chamber that work with a lot of employers to help them improve their skill signaling um, and aggregating their demand, the demand side for skills and starting to make work to make that job description data more machine readable and searchable on the web. So part of this is, is doing that collective action work. And I think one, one thing we've observed is that this ecosystem of folks really comes together when we focus on that individual worker and learner and what they need to get ahead. So that's been one thing that we've done is 
really identify that, uh, that central use case that will um, enable individuals to navigate their training options or be able to share their skills with employers more effectively to get hired based on the skills that they have. Those really have gotten folks in this ecosystem um, kind of coming together and really showing up to do the work that's required to make sure that those use cases can be realized. So I think one thing we've seen is that everyone can get behind um, efforts around shared data that really allow that learner and worker to share what they can do and how to get, get ahead in their careers. So um, identifying those use cases collectively is something we've done a lot of work on with, uh, with this group. We have um, also just observed that breaking down these silos between these different stakeholders has been really important part of the work that we're doing at, at Bright Hive. So uh, working with folks to understand these points of connection, um, where does this data connect? Where does data on jobs connect with data on training? Um, where does data on individual skills connect with jobs? and helping kind of weave those together to, to be able to um, present a different picture of that user story that Danielle shared earlier. Um, part of this work around improving the talent data infrastructure, it's definitely not super sexy. It's not something I think anyone gets really <laughs> um, jazzed up to do when they wake up in the morning, but in order to be able to build those apps that are really important to serving workers, in order to give workers and learners that ability to navigate their options in this marketplace, it's just really necessary work. So part of the work we've been doing with the Chamber of Commerce Foundation through the T3 Innovation Network, um, which is a public private network has been kind of looking out at this, um, this inventory of all the data standards that are out there in the market being used by employers being used by higher ed, being used by um, HR systems and vendors and being able to draw, draw connection points between them. So coming to this realization that we don't need everyone to use the same standard. Um, it's okay if we use different standards because they meet different needs in, in this ecosystem. But if system A uses one standard and system B uses another, um, now that they're mapped, they can actually talk to each other in a way that they normally wouldn't be able to. So um, we've been thinking about that and also looking at um, what are some ways that we can actually form collaboratives where public and private sectors come together um, and think about how they use and adopt standards, which ultimately will improve interoperability. And then I think the other step that we've done with Chamber and with um, WGU and others is to just understand the unique goals and skills that each of these actors in the marketplace um, is bringing to the table. You know, everyone I think is solving for a very distinct or specific piece of this worker learner journey. Um, so we've been thinking about how we uh, characterize that and understand where the value is for certain folks to, to do the work. So that might be um, chamber being in the position they're in with working with employer networks, being able to do the work on job description data and, you know, helping employers be able to better communicate um, what they're hiring for. Um, and that might be WGU who we'll hear from later being able to help higher ed and post-secondary training providers map their programs to skills. So that's just a couple of the, um, the steps we've taken in the last uh, couple years to help try to bring this ecosystem together. So you said there was some unsexy work. Here's a slice of behind the scenes that we wanna show you as an example of how to use an open infrastructure and data sharing to allow people to put their skills, in this case, into a digital record, which you can use to apply to school, transfer, um, plug into a career exploration tool, apply to work, and then have it record the skills and achievements gained at work too. 
These use cases are all very flexible and the um, order in which they're done can all change. In fact, what we're trying to point out is that this is enabling of many different use cases. So in this one, the individual they own and they choose the uses of this record. Um, and this infrastructure is um, quite deep. It accelerates um, all these use cases because it has flowing in its pipes an atomic semantic unit, the machine readable skill. They can be stacked, re-expressed in different formats, compared for equivalency with other skills, and much more. It isn't necessary for everyone to use the same laundry list of skills either. Algorithmic translation will help us there, but only with responsible data sharing between the owners and stewards of the skills, or in a broader sense, the data. People, employers, educators, career tools, um, anyone involved. Open data, whenever possible, helps with identifying the biases in this data and the training data for the algorithms. And strong data governance, controls, and review makes robust privacy and ethical use possible when the data um, cannot be open, but also um, when it is. So some things we can pull out of here for applicability across industries and sectors would be lessons like um, signaling between, um, uh, you know, in our case, we have employers to, um, to, uh, to education to help signal aggregate industry needs, but it could be um, any group signaling to another um, in, in a way where the language doesn't have to be one common language, so to speak, um, but each can speak their own and the information can still be communicated through interchange. Um, we have um, open standards to help store the data and processes to translate between those formats. Um, standard and um, recommendation assisted conversion from unstructured data to machine readable. This is really big. Um, you just can't do as much, certainly with a PDF, um, but also with things in Word document, um, you know, heaven forbid images, um, but also any kind um, of, you know, paper or, or unstructured uh, data. Once you get that into machine readable, there's just springing forth of things that you can do. And then the last thing we hope that you'll think about is multiple interacting governances. So within one organization, the, the intra uh, communication um, to prevent the silos within the organization and also interconnection through the whole ecosystem. That's the kind of things that can be enabled. So to bring back Olivia, with all that infrastructure, we'd like to see um, if we can't help her pay less, complete quicker, and earn the wages that she deserves. So her experience may have some higher highs and lows. So we're not gonna say that the, the job search will be a dream, um, but we believe it must get better. And if she were more empowered with data at the beginning and throughout her journey, she may be able to jumpstart her career. So the entire burden of communication is not on her each time she interacts with the organizations, but it's assisted um, between the organizations for her and, and it's owned by her. Um, so here you can see that we kind of pulled up a little bit of this customer journey in terms of the overall sentiment. Um, it may not, you know, it may not look like a lot, but this is a really, could be a really big difference in people's lives. Um, and just kind of bring up some of the, the, the low points of these, these processes so that she can tie her end goals um, to the kinds of actions she needs to take at the beginning and throughout with like longitudinal and outcomes data. So at this point, I'm gonna pass back to Laura um, to talk about some of the work that we've done and how our partners have enabled um, moving towards this vision. Yes, wonderful. We thought it would be great to bring some of our partners and colleagues that we've worked with in this talent marketplace and have been a huge part of working to connect the disconnected 
um, ecosystem that we've been talking about today. So we wanted to give uh, folks an opportunity to hear directly from them and learn about their work that they've been doing to make data more uh, accessible with that ultimate vision of serving that worker and learner um, and kind of getting, getting to tell that second story that Danielle shared about Olivia's journey. So we have Josh Westfall from the US Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Chamber is really focusing on improving um, conditions on the demand side of the equation. So thinking about employers, um, providing tools and leading projects that are working to increase signaling and improve that, uh, that talent marketplace. So I, I know we have Josh on. Um, so Josh would love to just have you introduce yourself and maybe say a few words about uh, some of these projects that Chamber has been leading and talk a little bit about that role of being a being a convener within this market. Thank you, Laura. Thank you, Danielle. Uh, and for hosting this webinar and, and talking about this really important topic and, and allowing us to kind of highlight some of our work in this space. So as Laura said, um, I'm Josh Westfall, the, the Director of Policy and Programs at the U.S. Chamber of Commerce Foundation. Uh, we are the nonprofit affiliate of the Chamber of Commerce, the largest business association in the world with 3 million members and 2,500 local and state chambers of commerce. On the foundation side, you'll see on the, the PowerPoint, our mission is to really strengthen America's long-term competitiveness. And one of the main uh, ways of doing that is through our workforce. So we have a whole department dedicated to the education and workforce of our nation. And one of our signature initiatives in workforce uh, is what you'll see on the third bullet, the Talent Pipeline Management, or TPM for short. Uh, and this is work that we've been doing since 2014. And it's really to build a, uh, it's an it's a, it's a initiative that's authentically employer-led and demand-driven based on data to build talent supply chains uh, to improve education workforce partnerships. And so there's a, there's a whole curriculum uh, and, and a lot of resources in this space of how to, how to build those partnerships that go across six strategies. But the main point is that we're bringing employer collaborators together, do their homework, get organized, get their data together, uh, start working through hiring practices and what their, their needs are, and then share them out with the community to build those talent supply chains. It sounds crazy at first, and people did think at first that we were, but actually employers did want to come together. They did want to share information on their hiring needs and the skills and, how, and what they can do to, uh, to get people in the workforce. And they wanted to work with the community as well and share data back and forth to build a supply chain that works. Uh, and so now we've been doing this with, we've trained hundreds of collaborators to do this work. Thousands of employers have worked with us in 33 states in Canada. Uh, and so that work there, it shows that partnerships are important and sharing that information. And, and especially when you have focused pain points and community partnerships uh, to really stay focused on what is the ROI for the workforce, uh, it really comes together. And that, that's TPM. But from that work, we also realized that it's not just an employer engagement problem. It's not just partnerships, but there's also that technology problem as well. And how can we better uh, improve those systems and make them more efficient? So when you look at things like the job data exchange uh, or JDX for short, we wanted to work on structuring data around jobs. What is in a job? How can you explain what are the needs and hiring needs? Do it more quickly and more efficiently and clearly to talent suppliers, the education community, individual workers, uh, and building some tools to make that a little bit easier. And what we realized there as well is that employers did want to come to the table. They did want to improve their job descriptions. And the education community, be community college, uh, a talent uh, 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 applicant tracking uh, trainers and, and ta uh, talent acquisition uh, uh, individuals, they also wanted to get more organized, structured data on jobs. And so it was a win-win, and these are things that were, were growing uh, in, in phase two for JDX as well. And the third thing that we realized from that is then it's not just the employer side of signaling and structuring data from jobs back down to, to the alignment of the education uh, community, but it's also from the education community to the workforce as well. It goes both ways. And that's where the T3 Innovation Network comes about is that we're working to build this public private data and technology infrastructure to more seamlessly move data from education systems to other education systems, to employment and even back and forth through those processes. Uh, and how do we do it more efficiently where we make sure all learning counts, we make sure that competencies and skills are the new currency of our marketplace 
and that we empower individual uh, learners and workers with their own data. And that is that unsexy part that Laura talked about, which is the data infrastructure play. It's hard to do. But with this T3 network, we also realize we have 500 organizations coming together to solve these big problems, make eight big project plays of building it with structured data, accessible data, and making it more usable to the individual. Uh, and that's where you'll see things like the interoperable learning records and, and that project work is combining all of these resources together to say, how can we make sure that someone can more seamlessly move through their career pathway, understand their opportunities that Danielle talked about, and be able to then share that information back. So uh, uh, as you can see, we've, we've done a lot of work in this space. A lot of it's with the great work with partners such as WGU and working with their initiatives and Bright Hive leading the way in a lot of their consulting. But it's an issue that we all agree on, but we need to put the time and resources into making sure that we make it as effective as possible. Awesome, thanks so much, Josh. Just curious, um, thinking about uh, your role and that importance of aligning and connecting with other data initiatives, um, can you speak a little bit to, you know, when you heard about this work um, that WGU is doing around open skills, or you heard about um, how the White House is starting to think about these interoperable learning records. Uh, why was it so important to, to connect and align um, with those folks? And, and what do you think would be at risk if you, you know, just continue to do your work uh, with your network in your, in your own silo? Well, as you, you stated, Laura, the, the idea of silos is, is very much a problem of our, our workforce of today. We have you know, education silos. And within education silos, we have K through 12 and higher ed and community college silos. And in the workforce, we have silos across your different employers. Uh, and so they're really all around us. And the, the, reason, the importance of partnerships in this space and to be able to work on some of this data infrastructure is you really don't know what you don't know. And so when you start working with these partnerships, learning about these open tools and skill sets and data that you can pull in to better inform yourself or better improve your individual software and systems, uh, it really opens up the marketplace for everyone. Uh, and so we've, uh, you know, we're, we're really pushing a lot on the importance of both accessible data, but also structured data to make these decisions. And if you don't start working in the partnerships, if we don't start keeping this, this uh, open market, and, and I do want to say that it, we're also in this process, it's, it's important that uh, as you build these infrastructures and as we've thought about a lot for the T3 Innovation Network and our other initiatives, is that we're vendor and standards neutral. We don't want to pick winners and losers. The market will do it itself. But if you work only by yourself in your software and your platform or even just with your data, then the ability to expand, you'd have to own the whole market. And although the idea of global domination sounds amazing, very few people can do that and very few businesses can do that. So if we start working together, you actually become a more competitive, a more competitive tool set service data infrastructure for everyone else and your harmonization and interoperability will make you more effective both nationally and globally than just trying to do it all on your own, which means everyone has to adhere to your policies, making it extremely hard for that to work. Yeah, that's a really good point. I think that's, that's why we talk about this work as a marketplace. Um, and, and as we think of the supply and demand of both employer and, and educator needs within that context, um, you know, of course we want to see a bunch of really amazing tools be developed that support learners and workers and help employers be able to make decisions. Um, but part of that work that I think Chamber has done really well and we've tried to really stick to as well is this is this work is meant to be um, vendor agnostic. We think that a thriving marketplace means there's a lot of different tools out there that serve different purposes um, and working to build that foundation where those tools can work really well um, and they can compete with one another for, for market share is actually a really good thing because it means there are more tools using good data and using shared data to um, to drive impact. So thank you, Josh. That's um, really appreciate all your, your insights um, and ideas. We also have uh, Casey Thorne from Western Governors University and uh, WGU is leading some new exciting work in this market that we really wanted to highlight. 
Um, you heard Josh speak a little bit about how Chamber and Open Skills Stack Alliance are working together. Um, again, a place where we've really worked to help our partners align and figure out where these connection points are. Um, so I think we can move to the next slide just to give a little more context on um, the Open Skills Stack Alliance. Danielle, is the slide moving or is it stuck? <laughs> Perfect. Um, so we have Casey on. Would love to just ask, uh, ask Casey a little bit to share some more about this new alliance around open skills and helping develop tools that, again, aim to help kind of the different folks in this marketplace be able to use skills data um, within their unique context. So Casey, would love for you to come off mute and tell us a little bit about kind of, um, or if you can share something about the origin story of what led to the OSS uh, being formed and share a little bit about what it is. Absolutely, thank you. So um, as Laura mentioned, my name is Casey Thorne and I am the Director of Skills Architecture at Western Governors University. Um, to give a, a little bit of framing for who we are as a university, we are a competency-based, fully online institution, and we are currently serving over 130,000 uh, students. So it is a, a really exciting space to be in, and um, we have really started to focus on uh, skills and what we can do as an institution to better serve two of our, our major um, customers and partners being students and employers. Uh, for a little bit of framing, um, we recognize that learners need opportunities to demonstrate and receive credit for the skills that they have no matter where they have gained them. And in order to do that, we have to better understand what the underlying skills are for the academic pathways that we have uh, for our students. Uh, more and more learners are needing value in their educational opportunities where they can get immediate return on their investments and they can develop skills as they uh, progress towards degree. Employers similarly need to hire skilled workers and to do that they need a way to easily identify that the skills an individual has based on the credentials that they hold. And that is an area that we know in higher ed as an institution um, we are lacking. We, we speak in a language of degree and credential and employers speak in a language of skill. And so the work that we have been doing uh, both at WGU and part of the Open Skill Stack Alliance, which I'll speak to in just a moment, is really addressing that piece of, of the, the necessary translation that needs to happen between credential and skill. Employers also need automated ways to match highly qualified candidates with the high value jobs that they need to fill. And they also need the ability to train and upskill their current employees. Um, it is a very costly endeavor to have to hire new um, when there can be more efficient systems in play to upskill current employees. But in, in order to do that, um, employers need better ways to understand where those skills uh, between roles and institutions even may overlap and where upskilling um, opportunities may exist. And then lastly, job seekers need access to educational options that match their goal and allow for the ability to skill and reskill in order to stay ahead of the obsolescence curve. Um, this is particularly applicable in fast paced areas like IT. And so they need the ability to be able to skill and reskill as needed without having to um, invest in entire degree programs in order to do that. Again, it comes down to more of that, that bite-sized learning opportunity where you're getting a return on the investment uh, of that educational experience immediately. So we recognize this as a problem at WGU that we wanted to solve and um, recognized that the underlying um, common denominator to this equation for both learners, higher ed institutions, and employers are skills. 
Um, but in order for us to really realize um, this dream of interoperability across technologies, across institutions, we recognize that the, um, the underlying data for those skills needs to speak to one another. Uh, different technologies that are used to surface skills information, um, HRIS systems, uh, educational institutions need to uh, speak a common language. And that common language is the underlying skills data um, that could fuel all of that. So um, WGU has uh, started and led a coalition of education providers, employers, technology companies, um, and this uh, initiative is known as the Open Skill Stack Alliance, where we are working towards a shared mission to establish skills-based education and hiring as a standard practice for the majority of organizations in the United States. The reason that this is so important is that there is a lot of skills data out there. It exists, but the problem is that it's either not accessible or it's not machine actionable, which makes it incredibly cumbersome and expensive um, to try and innovate around and to try and move forward with uh, data-driven skills-based um, information. So part of the uh, Open Skill Stack Alliance um, is to really bring together players, again, in government, uh, education and industry to really start talking about how we could move towards uh, shared structured data that would allow for different technology systems to be able to better speak to one another as well as to more seamlessly share that skills data back and forth. And so that really is the charge of the Open Skills Stack Alliance. Uh, is to create that, that shared data foundation uh, that will allow for um, more opportunities and, and really more innovation that can be built on top of that, that uh, shared infrastructure once we break those data silos down. Awesome, Casey. Thanks for hitting on um, so many of those important points. And just, you know, it's been fun for us at Bright Hive to be able to work with you all on launching this initiative. And um, curious if you could share a little bit about, like, um, as we're building this alliance, these partnerships have been really critical in getting the right stakeholders to the table to be a part of this alliance has been a lot of the work that you all have been doing and that we've been helping support. So. Um, would just love for you to speak a little bit about, you know, what would be at risk if OSS had approached that differently or had not go, gone in with this, um, with this perspective of needing to build a little, an alliance? What if you were just focusing on the tools and not um, focusing as much around bringing folks together? What do you think that outcome would look like? Yeah, I think in, in the simplest way that I can describe what I perceive that problem to be is that there will be a whole lot of work, money, and time spent on solving problems that will only solve a portion of the larger problem and may be very institution-specific um, in what that problem solves. So that's, that is great for the solver but that doesn't fix the problem for learners, workers, employers at large. Um, I think that you spoke to this a little bit earlier, Laura, that ultimately we are all trying to save, to solve for the same problem at a macro scale. We may each be trying to solve for little portions of that in a different way. And the power behind that can really accelerate if there is that shared data underneath it that will allow for more innovation and acceleration of interoperability if we can get to a point where these different tools, technologies, innovations can speak a similar language so that if, you know, we, we at WGU solve a problem, the way that we've structured that data could potentially solve it for someone else. So, for me, it all boils down to um, the, the more use cases that you can solve for, the better. And that's why the collaboration across different organizations has been so important, because we want to make sure that we are solving for that skills divide on a macro scale and not through one lens. Awesome. Um, really appreciate that, Casey and Josh, for sharing those perspectives. 
um, the next, so the next slide before, I think we kind of move into some questions and discussion with the audience is to just share out a couple lessons that I think we've been able to document and learn as we've been working, um, working in this space and would also uh, encourage Casey and Josh, if there are other lessons that you want to throw in here, um, feel free to just, uh, just shout them out. But I think something we've learned in starting this work is, you know, sometimes there's a new initiative or a new player that's coming in, they're launching a new effort to improve some piece of this talent marketplace data in some meaningful way. Um, and I think sometimes we've seen there be concern or worries that, you know, this might be duplicating our effort or folks might not be familiar with one another um maybe going after the same funding and so i think something we've learned here is is just to help um our partners orient themselves within this market and really think through you know these are the specific um skills or tools that we're bringing to the table and we're working to solve like casey said this one piece of the puzzle that we're solving for um but that recognition that if it's not connected from these other efforts that are working to improve um, very related and interconnected pieces of the data puzzle um, that you might be duplicating or creating more work where um, you know other efforts have already put in the time to understand the landscape of data standards or they've already worked to identify really important use cases that get people really excited and so I think part of it Part of that learning too for us is seeing what happens when we can get folks to come together around a common set of use cases, which is uh, work that I think we're doing both with the chamber on um, T3 and other efforts we've been a part of and also with WGU is helping establish those core use cases um, that everyone can get behind. Um, even if you're solving for a very specific piece of it, um, it's being able to articulate that and get folks on the same page about what are the what are the things we're really trying to solve for. So, for example, um, a worker that's able to capture the full spectrum of their learning and working journey, being able, like Casey said, to document skills that are learned um, could be through a training program, could be through on the job experiences, could be through an apprenticeship, but be able to capture that uh, that data in a way that's meaningful and be able to share that with employers and share it with uh, with educators who can quickly understand the skills that that individual brings and what um, jobs might be right for them or what additional training might be supportive. So that's um, that's a use case that people have gotten really behind. Um, and it's something that we're thinking a lot about as we do this work on this um, interoperable learning records that common record that learners and workers are able to take with them um, at these different touch points across that that user journey that um, that Danielle shared. Um, another is is helping the employer be able to, to both distill and share their needs in a way that helps job seekers and helps education and training providers get really clear messages about what skills are in demand and what skills they actually need to fill specific roles so that those training providers and, um, and educators are able to shape their training in ways that meet those needs. That's been a really important um, use case that we've explored uh, with, I think, a lot of these efforts that we've been a part of. Um, and then another piece of this too around the use cases is creating these processes for folks that are involved in these in these data efforts to be able to validate the use cases and vet them um, and help prioritize because there's a lot of them that are really exciting but you know what's the first one that we're trying to work on and how do we address that um, another learning i think is just that fiefdoms create silos so um, and this hasn't been too much of an issue, I think, with the groups we've been working with who really come from this place of, you know, we're addressing this very particular issue, but we understand that the work we're doing can't be siloed or else it's not going to be as impactful and it's not going to um, be able to work with an employer system or an educator system. So it also, you know, trying to help folks see that um, working in that silo really means that 
you might have blinders on, so you might not be aware of the the other work. It might be hard to see this bigger vision for, you know, if, if we're doing this awesome project that's going to help articulate skills. Um, we also have to think about the work that this other group is doing with employers around job descriptions. Those things have to connect. So I think the being able to show that broader vision for how these different tools and data can be more, even more valuable if they're connected with other data efforts. Um, that's really a, an important learning that we have. And then I think, as, as we mentioned, being able to connect these different pieces of the puzzle means that everyone who has um, a distinct project in this space or an effort um, is be able to is able to see that big picture and understand where they um, where they're oriented. And I, I think um, part of the role that we've played at Bright Hive that we really enjoy playing is kind of as like a matchmaker connector. So having that look into um, different pilots that different groups are running or um, different efforts that are being launched nationally, being able to um, help these different groups connect and be able to see the way that working together and aligning is going to create better outcomes for, you know, for everyone's effort, um, especially as we're kind of playing in this open data space with, um, with a lot of these efforts in the talent marketplace. Um, and I think the last point is that governance is important. So even with open data initiatives, decisions are being made about data and its use. Um, so a lot of the work I think that's ahead for us in this space is thinking about what that governance looks like within a connected ecosystem. So um, I think we want to kind of open it up now for any discussion. I know folks shared in the chat um, where they're coming from and what industries they're working in, but we'd just love to hear um, in the in the industry that you're working in, um, are there any examples of data that, you know, you feel you really need to do your work or to improve your product or tools that you're offering that you wish you had access to, but you currently don't? Um, would love for anyone to just chime in and share out um, any data needs that you have that you're currently not able to access. Anyone wanna share? All right, and I'll also open it up to others on our team at Bright Hive who are on and our speakers as well. Um, any examples you've seen where disconnected data poses a barrier to progress? So this could be an example from healthcare. It could be an example from the tech world. We just love to hear um, if, if disconnected data is, is currently playing a role um, in your world in some way. This is such a quiet group. Ooh, was someone just about to speak? Uh, yeah, Laura, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, okay. So what, one example we found through talent pipeline management uh, is that when we were bringing these collaboratives of employers together to talk about what were their pain points within a, a specific industry in a, in a position, uh, they were coming together to figure that out and then share their, uh, their job descriptions. And we found that when we started, when they started sharing their job descriptions and we brought them back in the aggregate and had them rank from one to five how important certain competencies or skill sets were, they were drastically off and they were very far from one another. And so if you only worked in a silo and you did not share data and we did not go through that collaborative process, everyone would keep just regurgitating their job description from 1998 and it would just keep going through the same process. But when we brought it together and then they actually worked as a group and did independent surveys, to then find what are the top needs and the hiring requirements for a certain job and position, uh, they did come towards a more shared language on their needs. And when we did the, our work with the job data exchange and JDX for short, we also realized that a lot of employers weren't able to find 
competency frameworks. They wanted to find more information. They wanted to improve the way that they were talking about their jobs, but they just couldn't based on paywalls or security settings or being members of associations. But when provided the opportunity to get information, they sought more. And so therefore their job descriptions usually started to improve and expand and, and, and have more detailed information because of the access to data, the ability to structure it uh, and, and being open to that. So we've seen it in both of our initiatives, the importance of it. And I would just tack on to that as well and say, um, you know, one of the exciting things we're hoping to come from out of the work that we're doing with the OSSA is that those competency frameworks a lot of the time um, are inaccessible in terms of the way that they're formatted. Um, they quite frequently, more than that you would hope to believe, are, are in PDF files, Word documents, um, and that makes it really hard to manipulate them and to scale it across the hiring organization. So um, we have encountered uh, the same, same obstacles. Yeah, those are really great points. And I think that really kind of hammers home also into the experience of the job seeker, how the result of this process is very unclear. Um, job descriptions and you know there's a lot of time wasted um, that doesn't need to be if you know this information can come through more more clearly and in a more structured way. Yep. Um, well I know we are getting really close to time so just wanted to thank everyone for joining this this session today. I hope it was interesting and valuable and um, thank you again to Josh and Casey for joining us and sharing a little bit about um, you know the work you've done in this space and the work we're doing together to connect data across uh, across talent and really um, putting that worker and that learner at the center of that work um, so with that i think we can close out and and say thank you to everyone for joining hope you enjoy the rest of good good tech fest and um and get to attend many other sessions so Thanks all, enjoy the rest of your day.